Welcome to this workshop for helping your child to transition to college. My name is Sarah Holmes and I'm a mental health practitioner working for the South West London St George Mental Health Trust and I work in Kingston and South Thames College. Today we're going to have a look at different types of change, common worries that your young person might have when starting college and your own worries with regards to this as well recognising stress and anxiety, anxiety in the body, how do you notice when your child is feeling anxious, helping them manage their anxiety and we're also going to look at being able to start a conversation when they're anxious, top talking tips, listening, empathy and validation. We're also going to look at things like relaxation and distraction techniques and your own self-care if you have anxieties around your child going to college and looking at how to get the support and advice that you might need. So examples of change, what we're looking at here. So moving house, starting new schools, you might have other children that starting new school, new siblings, divorce, divorce is a tough one, very difficult times for young people and parents as well. Illness and Covid lockdowns, this is something that's highly unusual, we're not used to being stuck indoors. New jobs, making new friends. So why is change hard? So we are creatures of habit, so we struggle with change. We like constancy and we're very attached to habits. So we have quite strong emotional responses to change. When faced with change, we can have a range of feelings from hope, excitement to anxiety and anger. And sometimes these emotions happen all at the same time. So why is change hard to accept? So people resist change because they believe they will lose something of value or fear they will not be able to adapt to the new ways. Is it too much of a change for me? Can I cope in this situation? It's a significant change to a young person's daily routine, which is deeply emotional because it threatens their level of safety and security. Now let's look at what might be the same and different for your young person starting college. So what's likely to be new? The journey itself to college may be quite a long distance compared to what they're used to. Subjects, well hopefully they'll be picking subjects that they enjoy and they're actually looking forward to doing. Timetables, these are likely to be more flexible than at school. They will have times when they're not actually in lesson. Friends, they may take some friends with them from school other people may be having a totally fresh start and have to make new friends. The environment might feel very different to school. They may be used to quite old buildings at school and they're moving into a new modern college. Studying with adult learners. Now this is quite common. They're likely to come into contact with adult learners. They may even be doing subjects where there are people who are quite a bit older than them themselves. Level of security tends to be quite strict in college with the use of lanyards and these tend to be enforced by security. Um, we encourage you as parents to encourage them to get on board with remembering to take their lanyards, removing hoodies and hats whilst around college. In the long run, this is for their safety and security as well. What's likely to be the same? Travelling independently. Now we can assume that they've been travelling to school themselves for quite a while. They may not have been, they may have been getting a lift off parents, so this might be very new for them as well. Getting themselves ready. We hope that they've been doing this for quite a, bit, uh, a while anyway. So, a young person's common worries about moving to college. So, thinking about getting lost, new big alien buildings, quite easy to get lost in them. The doubts around have they chosen the right course? It might have been quite a while before since they've chosen the course and doubts can set in over the summer holidays. Making friends. If they're likely to be moving to a, a college quite away from home, 
where they're not likely to know anybody, concerns around making new friends, being bullied. Now this can be quite a common one if a young person has been bullied previously at school, it's quite common for them to assume that this is going to travel with them or they're going to be bullied again whilst in school. Is the course going to be difficult? They may have doubts about their ability uh, academically, they may have struggled in school and they may have struggled to get the grades they need. So this is quite common thinking that they're not going to be able to do the course. Strict teachers, is this likely to be an issue? What is there if there is a problem on my journey to college? If a young person has got quite a distance to travel and quite a different mode, modes of transport, it can be quite difficult to navigate these, especially in rush hour. Problems around being late, will they get into trouble? Being able to manage homework, being organised enough to do the different types of homework that's needed. So, how do your worries differ from your young persons? So you might need to know about how to communicate with different people at college. What are they likely to be doing when they're not in lesson? Are they out and about in the local area? What sort of friends are they likely to make? How motivated is your young person going to be in order to complete the course? Will they be safe? How supportive will they be to study? What if there is a problem on their journey to college? Parents evenings, is this likely a likely thing in the college? And the access to financial support. So some of these worries are things that you and your young people can have some influence over. For example, being provided with the right information. So what to do if they're late, how to get financial support. Other worries you may have less control over. So things like whether the course is going to be manageable for them and who their friends are likely to be. And this loss of control as a parent can often fuel your own anxiety. So, so if you can think back to when your child started secondary school, what helped with that transition, both for you and for your, for your child? So here I've come up with a few examples. So what might have helped is being able to look around and familiarise yourselves and your child with the buildings, being able to speak to some of the teachers, doing practice runs to school before term started. And here are examples also of what might made things a bit more anxiety provoking. So not knowing who to talk to, a lack of communication, not knowing what to expect on the day and not knowing where to go. So change can be exciting too. So it's not all doom and gloom. So here are some examples what students have looked forward to in previous occasions. So it's quite easy to get bogged down in the negative and trying to reassure your young person that it's going to be okay. So making new friends, having a fresh start, being treated more like an adult, being able to wear their own clothes and have that more independence, learning subjects, hopefully ones that they enjoy, having a more flexible timetable and being able to focus on their favourite subjects. So encourage them to think about what they are looking forward to, not just what they're feeling anxious about. So how can change be good for us? Now, although change can be scary and create uncertainty, it can also help us develop. Change can teach us to adapt and help us develop resilience if we can understand our own capacity for growth and learning. When change makes us better, it's because we have learned how to turn a challenging situation to our own advantage. We've looked at it, we've problem solved and we've managed it in our own way. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of what stress and anxiety looks like. Now, we tend to feel anxious in our body before anything else. And this is particularly common because it's we're looking at adrenaline which is preparing our body for action. 
and common symptoms include sweating, heart racing, butterflies, might be feeling sick, trembling, that sort of thing. Now, we're also looking at the thought side of it. So often we get caught up in negative thought patterns, which make us feel as if we're unable to cope, especially in new situations. So these thoughts are around an overestimation of danger and that underestimation for our ability to cope in these situations. And when this happens, when we feel anxious and we have anxious thoughts, our behaviour changes as well. We tend to avoid the situations that are causing us anxiety. You don't get the opportunity to learn if it's as bad as you think it will be when we avoid these situations. Poor sleep and appetite problems are quite common when we're feeling very anxious. And sometimes we can get very short tempered as well. So these are the three characteristics when recognising stress and anxiety. So what does anxiety look like in the body? So here we have an example of different types of bodily sensations within the body. And as you can see from this diagram, it can pretty much cover the whole body. So tense muscles, for example, we're looking at the biology here in relation to sugars and fats are converted for use as energy. And these are sent to our major muscles to help us fight or run away. So when we start to feel shaky, that is these different sort of conversions within the body, preparing our legs and arms for action. We sweat, so our hands and feet often feel cold as the blood supply is diverted to the brain and the muscles that are needed. Gut activity, so when we feel sick or we have butterflies, this is slowing down the blood supply to this particular area because we don't use our digestive system the same when we're anxious. This is also why we probably don't feel like we want to eat. Our heart is racing, it is a pump, it is pumping the blood around the body to work more efficiently. Lungs, when we start feeling like we can't breathe, you start to breathe more shallow, shallowly. And what's happening here is your breathing rate is increasing, your airways are dilating, and it's making more oxygen into your blood. And this is why sometimes you might feel lightheaded as well. You, for the brain, you may be, feel like you're becoming more alert for danger, for different threats around you, and you start to hear more. So you're actually looking at the threat from an audio sense as well. Now we're going to look at what a little bit of stress looks like. So this is an optimum stress chart. So if you notice at the bottom, we're looking here that when you're feeling very calm, really a bit meh, bored. You don't feel like doing anything. As we move into the middle here, this is where, this is what we call peak performance. So this is the, the, the amount of stress we need in order to perform properly throughout the day in terms of academic achievement, athletic achievement. This is where people thrive and when we're in that flow state as well. And when we're looking at the other side, this is where we're in deep distress, fatigue, exhaustion, might even feel ill. And this is where burnout is more likely to happen. So when a young person is anxious a lot of the time, this is where they're likely to be. So how do we know if our children are struggling? So you know your own young person, so you may know the signs anyway. These signs might be very, very subtle or they may be really obvious. Um, so typical signs to look out for are sleep difficulties, appetite problems, changes in behaviour and withdrawal. Now, it can be quite difficult when your teenager might be quite moody, usually in relation to hormones. So they may be with quite withdrawn anyway. They may spend a lot of time in their bedroom but hopefully you will still notice if there are new changes in their behavior now bring 
a parent isn't the easiest job in the world um, and especially when they're teenagers it can be even harder as if they, these young people are actually quite alien to us so here's some tips on how to start a conversation especially around when they're feeling anxious about things so just basic how you're feeling you may get shot down you, they may start speaking to you even having conversations around i know that college is a big change so acknowledging that they may be anxious about starting college is there anything you are feeling worried about that you feel are okay to share so just asking them are you okay to share this they may not they may not want to but because you've opened that conversation it might give them that bit of a boost so even discussing things that they might be looking forward to as well is there anything you need from me so actually saying look i'm here for you is there anything you want me to do do they need space time to talk do you want to do something fun you can talk to me i'm here for you if you need to talk with someone else that is okay so acknowledging that you may not be the right person that they want to talk to don't take it personally they, sometimes it just they don't want to worry you either and it's easy to talk to somebody they don't really know or have an attachment to acknowledging that you might not understand what the problem is but that you want to be able to understand and it's important that you actually acknowledge that yeah you, you're a parent you don't get it right all the time i don't understand everything that you're going through but i'm here for you and, that, and i'm just basically putting it out there i love you and that's not going to change and even just saying if you could have to stay over what would you like to be different just little starters it's very difficult to start a conversation when your young person is quite anxious anyway so here's some talking top tips so as a parent of an anxious teenager it's perfectly normal to want to fix their anxiety and we'll try and throw lots of ideas techniques and strategies at them and hoping that something is going to stick and make them feel better and when it doesn't it's easy to get quite frustrated both with yourself and with them so is it the right time to talk so choosing the right time and place is likely to get a better result wait until you are both less tired communication tends to flow more easily feed your teenager before any discussion as you will stabilize blood sugar levels which helps with concentration and they are less likely to be hangry so schedule time give your teen advance notice that you'd like to have a chat tell them what it's about so don't just drop it on them for example and I'm concerned about how you are struggling at the moment and want to discuss how best to support you. This will help them prepare mentally and not feel caught off guard. Walk and talk. While some teenagers open up with a chat over juice or a coffee, the majority respond better when on the move. Keeping active will lessen eye contact, which can come across as aggressive and cause them to withdraw. Go for a walk or suggest doing each other's nails, if it's a girl, or doing something more fun. It's less likely to feel uncomfortable if the focus is on something physical. Most times, teenagers' behaviour and attitude are not personal, so try to keep your defences low. They might get, come across as having a bit of an attitude, so don't make it about you. Keep your emotions under control and this will help you to stay calm and them to feel like they can still talk to you as well. Listen more than you talk. Don't make it a lecture. Teenagers tend to feel that they're not given enough opportunity to be heard anyway. So this allows them to feel listened to and be respect respectful of your thoughts and ideas, even if you disagree with what they have to say it doesn't need to become an argument so the key things here in relation to talking to our young people are listening empathy and validation and these are really important and key to being able to have a decent conversation with your young person sometimes in in times when there's high emotion and stress as a parent so 
even looking back to when you were younger and looking at, or even now, how do you know you're being listened to? How does it feel when you're being validated? And being able to do that with your young person as well. And in the reverse, how does it feel when you're ignored or you're not listened to or you're not validated? Or people don't empathize how does that feel as well so being able to put yourself in your young person's shoes and going yeah I can see why you would probably be angry or really upset about something so here's some examples in relation to listening empathizing and validating so pay attention to their body language facial expressions and gestures if you're having a conversation with your young person and you notice them start to tense up, this might be a time to stop the conversation. They may have, when they tense, it might be because something we've said has made them feel a bit angry, but they're not showing it other than in the tension of their body. So this might be a time to acknowledge, have I got something wrong here? Or is, the is this the best time to to have this conversation if not we will revisit it make time to chat regularly try another day if they don't want to talk about it now sit at their level if you hover or stand over them it can look a bit intimidating take a deep breath relax and focus on what you want to talk about paying attention lets them know that you are taking their concerns seriously and that you're willing to spend time with them and as they reveal feelings, reflect back what you hear and notice about them. So checking in that you've understood correctly, because a young person's language might be quite different to what we're used to. Have we understand what they understood what they're saying? So just checking in. Uh, you said this. Is this correct? Listen to them tell you their worries and try to see the situations and emotions through their eyes. Show your understanding, even share examples from your own life when you felt similarly. But try and keep this to a minimum because at the end of the day, this is about them. And after they tell you what's going on for them, then you can ask questions. This is where you use open ended questions just to expand on something they might have said. And don't discount feelings or tell them how they should feel or don't even try using logic. This is how they're feeling at the moment. It might not make sense, but just being able to sit with it not making sense and don't try and fix it. This is something that you can do together. What would you like me to do? How would you like me to support you in this? That sort of thing. So these are students comments from previous years about starting college. Some people have said that they feel excited. They feel like they're more independent. Some have been more brave and saying fear is simply an emotion, which it is. It is something that goes. There was some nervousness, which is perfectly normal. Being able to accept the uncertainty and the fear and being able to keep an open mind on the future. Now, what can you do as a parent to help your child manage any worries that they have about college? So these are more practical steps in relation to contacting people that are the right people to speak to either in school, if they're still at school, waiting to move up to college, any concerns there. Encourage them to connect with peers and tutors at the college. So maybe keeping an open dialogue going with a course tutor that they might be having the new year. Any people that they might, some people set up WhatsApp groups, things like that for new students, just to get to know people. Help them navigate their emails from the college. They may be bombarded by emails and only read half of the information to not fully understand what's happening. So even just asking them, can I have a look at these with you? Let's see if we can work through them together and then getting them to respond to any emails that they have to respond to. Support them to speak to student services. So if there's any help around bursaries, if they need uh, financial support in terms of managing their workload, 
if they already have existing worries and anxiety before starting college and their emotional health as well. Next, we're going to have a look at some relaxation strategies. Now, these are ideal for you and for your young person. So the two main examples of relaxation are controlled breathing, which is the most effective way of calming the body down. So just breathing in for four and breathing out for a bit longer, just gently sort of breathing, being mindful of how we breathe. This tends to calm the butterflies and the shakes down quite quickly and muscle relaxation. Now, it's quite common when we're anxious to feel tense most of the time. So we don't always notice this. So doing some muscle relaxation by clenching and unclenching individual muscles, such as making a fist and releasing it, helps us recognize the difference between a tense and a relaxed muscle. So we're also going to look at distraction techniques. So distraction techniques are another way to reduce anxious feelings. So when we feel anxious, we focus on how we are feeling in our bodies, which makes us feel even more anxious. So it's very easy just to focus on how we're feeling and we get stuck in that and we make ourselves more anxious. By using distraction, we can focus on things around us instead, as we can't focus on our bodies and our environment at the same time. Um, so here's two typical examples so looking at different things of color so it could be finding five green things in their local vicinity um, five things they can see four things they can touch three things they can hear two things they can smell and one thing they can taste and there are lots of other suggestions as well and even though in around the sort of college environment just reading posters things like that takes their mind off where they're going or what they're going to have to do. Now, here we're looking at healthy ways to deal with stress. So the previous slides gave us some examples of managing or reducing stress and anxiety. Um, so these are things that are quite normal to use. Um, these sort of things normalize feeling anxious as well. So things like just going outside, relaxing, just doing something fun. You might even as a parent have your own ways of managing stress, which you might want to share with your young person. And this normalizes feeling anxious. So tips to manage when under pressure. So here are some ideas about when feeling under pressure for yourself and for your young person. So work out what the triggers are and anticipating these happening. So if a young person automatically struggles in new situations, this in itself is a trigger. So anticipating that there's going to be problems and anxieties in new situations. And anticipating makes them more manageable. Identify what time of day people are more alert to be able to tackle more important tasks. Making lists, especially for young people, it's ideal to make lists to be able to create some sort of um, consistency and routine around what they have to do. Take regular breaks, things that help slow down and make young people feel more calm. Setting yourself targets and making sure they're small and achievable because when we don't achieve our targets, we feel very despondent, fed up. Whereas if we make them more achievable, we feel a, a bit of empowerment there as well. And not doing too much at once. When we have a lot of things on our plate, when we try to do everything at once, this makes it so much harder and harder and anxiety provoking. And ask for help. You make sure that your young people ask for help and yourself, if you're feeling under pressure, asking someone for help as well and varying activities changing things around make, keeps things interesting and less boring so managing our own anxiety and stress now your young person moving to college isn't just a big change for them it is for you as a parent you get a new set of worries 
too many to list in a workshop, so it is important to be able to manage our own anxieties in order to be in a good place to support them. So reflect yourself on how full your stress bucket is and are you doing enough to reduce the stress level? So let's have a look at some self-care. So what is self-care? We hear this thrown around quite a lot at the moment along with mindfulness. So what actually is it? So this means taking care of yourself so that you can be healthy, you can function effectively, you can help others and do everything you need to do and accomplish in a day. Now what self-care is not is being selfish, only thinking of yourself or being self-indulgent. So here are a few examples of what some people do for self-care. A bit of a pamper session, might go for a run, listening to music. If you enjoy doing art, this is a really good stress reliever. Baking or just walking out in the country, just enjoying the fresh air. These are other examples that you might enjoy and these are things that you can do with your teenager as well, giving them examples of things they might want to do. So getting them baking with you. You can have a bath, shopping, doing something physical, getting them to do some nails with you or face masks. Spending time with pets is very important as well. Doing some binge watching on TV, picking a series that you and your young person might enjoy together. So now we're going to have a look at some recommended apps. Now these are just a few examples of apps to help manage stress and anxiety. There are a lot more about as well. So we've got things like Cove, which helps capture the mood in through music. If you love listening to music and no doubt your young people are regularly hooked up to music. There are different um, guides for thought challenging. So young people who are struggling with anxious thoughts, this might be a good thing to try out there. Um, we've got some guided meditation apps, especially Headspace. That's quite a well known one that these can be looked at. And what we do as a service is we look at them ourselves and do some research around these apps before we recommend them. So if you want to throw a few apps out at a young person, it might be a good idea to just try these out yourself as well. So in relation to seeking support, now there are a variety of different websites, um, phone numbers that you can contact. Um, here are just a few. So the Young Minds is a brilliant website for parents and for young people. They have a variety of videos and guidelines and tips, activities that can be shared with young people who are feeling anxious. Childline is one of the well-known ones. Papyrus is quite um, specialised in relation to self-harm, things like that. So there is help out there and especially if you contact the relevant college, they will also be able to signpost things as well. So here we have, this is my service. So we are part of the Children and Young People's Wellbeing Service and we provide support for young people between the ages of 16 and 18 usually in relation to anxiety, low mood and some anger management. And this is where the service is actually uh, located currently. So we are based in Kingston College, South Thames College, Merton College, Carl Charlton, Richmond and Croydon at the moment. So if any of your young people are going to those colleges, this is where we're based at the moment. And we also have a YouTube channel which shows lots of different videos for different in relation to different topics, including support around your teen sleep, healthy relationships, anxiety, exam stress, and some really good ones just for parents as well. So that's definitely worth a, a visit and a subscribe. So thank you very much for watching today and good luck with your young person starting college.